Well, greetings, welcome in. We are so grateful that you chose this opportunity to see our First Grace morning worship celebrations together. We hope that this can be a resource for you in conjunction with belonging to and being known by a local church fellowship. By no means does this substitute that, and we pray that you, wherever you are, would be able to find that. We are so excited about the opportunity to study the scriptures together, and we hope that this can be a resource for you. If you have been blessed by the ministries of First Grace as well, you can give back at www.firstgrace.com slash online giving. And we would love to be able uh, to see that investment go forward in ministry. So God bless you. And we hope that you are edified and delight in the scriptures as we study them together today. I want you to sing this little chorus with me. Greater is he that is in me, greater is he that is in me, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Greater is he that is in me, greater is he that is in me, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Come on, sing it with me. Greater is he that is in me. Greater is he that is in me. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Greater is he that is in me. Greater is he that is in me. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world, than he that is in the world. Anybody know where that scripture is? Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world? Nope. Well, you'll figure it out. You'll find out where it is. I'll, I'll give you a clue. First John. You can just keep looking. Greater is he that is in me. Who's that talking about anyway? Who's in me? If I'm a believer in Jesus Christ, who takes up residence in my life? The Spirit of God does. You know, we talk about inviting Jesus to come into your heart. And we say that to our children. And it's a good thing to say. I mean, they can understand that uh, Jesus is, you know, going to indwell their life. But actually, you know, it's not Jesus coming in and, you know, sitting in our heart, in our cardiac space in here. It's the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God that takes up residence in us. And when we accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit comes in. And that is a powerful thing because it's a resource for everything that you need. And greater is he that Holy Spirit that's in you than he that is in the world. Isn't that great news? Hey, we can beat anything. Hey, the Holy Spirit's bigger than COVID, amen? The Holy Spirit's bigger than any presidential administration that's doing vile things, amen? Holy Spirit's better than all kinds of chaos in our world. He beats it all, amen? Hey, we've got the resource and it's a perfect backdrop to talk about what we need to talk about today. Um, this is an amazing story. You know that a lot of times I like to kind of preface a message with some sort of a preparatory story, some sort of an intro that'll kind of get you on the, the right page. But um, I don't really have to do that this morning because this story is so amazing and it's so unhinged, so <laughs> really wild that I don't really think it needs any introduction. It's just awesome all by itself. And it once again shows us what the whole theme of the book of Mark is all about. And we've called this series in Mark, The Suffering Servant and The Reigning King. And within the last couple messages, we've really zeroed in on Jesus Christ, who is the reigning king. Last week, we saw that he was in a boat 
with the disciples and others. They were coming across the Sea of Galilee, a trek that was probably about eight miles, and in that short a space across the Sea of Galilee, all of a sudden, this hurricane of a storm came up to the point that they were all fearing that they were going to die. Where was Jesus? Totally chill. <laughs> Going night night in the boat. He was sleeping and was not worried at all. Come on, friend. In the middle of your storm, if you've got Jesus in the boat, you can relax because he's got it completely under control. He is the King of Kings. He is the Lord of Lords. There's not a storm that comes to our lives that he doesn't know about. He really does know. He knows your situation. He knows today if you're suffering. He knows today if you're hurting. And he certainly knows if there's a storm. Well, he also knew what was gonna be on the other side. When they finally made that trek across the Sea of Galilee, the boat pulled up on the other side. It was on a shore where a group of people called the Gezerines lived. And um, this was an amazing uh, story because the first thing that they were confronted with were not just any people, but one specific one. And we're going to read about it in Mark chapter 5, starting with verse 1. If you've got your Bibles, I'd like you to turn there. Hopefully you've got your Bible with you. Perfect time to get into your Bible. We're going to read this together. We're going to stand for the reading of God's Word, and we're going to read 20 verses. This is the whole story, and um, you're going to be riveted to the details of this story. Let's stand together, and we'll read Mark chapter 5, starting with verse 1. They came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gerasenes. And when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. Now just a little editorial note here. An unclean spirit, we're talking about a demonic spirit. An ambassador of the enemy, Satan. Verse 3, he lived among the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had often been bound with shackles and chains, but he wrenched the chains apart, and he broke the shackles in pieces. No one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day, among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out and cutting himself with stones. And when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and fell down before him. And crying out with a loud voice, he said, What have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I admire you, or I adjure you by God. Do not torment me. For he was saying to him, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And Jesus asked him, What is your name? Speaking to the demon. And he replied, my name is Legion, for we are many. And he begged him earnestly not to send them out of the country. Now a great herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside. And they begged him, saying, send us to the pigs. Let us enter them. So he gave them permission. And the unclean spirits came out and entered the pigs. And the herd, numbering about 2,000, rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned in the sea. The herdsmen fled and told it in the city and in the country, and people came to see what it was that had happened. And they came to Jesus and saw the demon-possessed man, the one who had had the legion, sitting there clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. And those who had seen it described to them began to beg Jesus to depart from their region. And as he was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed with demons begged him that he might be with him. And he did not permit him, but said to him, go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. 
And he went away and began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him, and everyone marveled. How about that? A Bible ghost story. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word and this account, which clearly shows us the power of Jesus. Lord, we worship him today as King of Kings and reigning Lord of Lords. We thank you, Lord. May this word impact on us and show us the reality of your power and your purpose for our lives. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. All right, you can be seated. I want you to be reminded today of 1 John 3, 8. Because 1 John 3, 8 says that the Son of God, who is Jesus, appeared for this purpose. And it's about this story that we just read. To destroy the works of the devil. That's the New Testament fulfillment of Genesis 3.15. And Genesis 3.15 was the word that was spoken over all all of the debacle that happened in the Garden of Eden. When Eve took of the fruit, gave it to Adam, they ate of the fruit which had been forbidden to them, and God said, this cannot stand. They were banished from the Garden of Eden. We were all plunged into sin because of Adam and Eve's choice to sin. And the word in the Garden of Eden was that one day, the seed of the woman would rise up and crush the head of the serpent, who is Satan. Now the fulfillment is here in the New Testament. Jesus is on the scene. He is the God-man. He came in flesh. He came to the earth, born as a little baby, grew up to be a man, and in his earthly ministry over this three-year period, he is continually having confrontations with the forces of Satan, the enemy. This is the fulfillment of everything that God said was supposed to happen. Today, this is the reason why the Holy Spirit in you is greater than the one who's in the world, who is Satan. The Bible calls him the prince of the power of the air, the God of this world. That is Satan, and he is real. This is not a fable, this is not a cute little story. No fantasy. This is real. This story is very, very real. This man who encountered Jesus as he came out of the boat was a demon-possessed man. Now it's amazing because this fulfillment of Genesis 3.15 says that the Son of Man came for this purpose, And, you know, of course it was to bring salvation, and he was on a mission to bring us salvation, but salvation itself destroys the works of the enemy. He wants you to fail. The enemy wants you to be destroyed. He shoots real bullets. He takes lives. He takes no prisoners. He just wants to see casualties. He's happy to see you living in bondage. The enemy wants to seek and destroy. That's all he's interested in. And here, once again, you see up close, in living color, a man that was possessed by an evil spirit, the forces of Satan and the forces of hell, and he was bent on destroying himself until he encountered Jesus. This was the Son of Man who came for the purpose of destroying the works of the devil. That's why in John 12, 31, he said the ruler of this world is cast out. John 16, 11, the ruler of this world is judged. Who is the ruler of this world right now? Hey, you don't have to wait too long. Just turn on your TV, turn on your HBO, which is hell's box office. You'll see who's ruling this world. You see, listen to the report of the media. Listen to the kinds of reports that you're hearing today. 
the kinds of things that are ruling our world, even within the last year and a half, the way that fear has gripped and ruled the people, that's nothing other than the rule of Satan in our world today. He is the ruler of this current world. But the good news again, we sang it, greater is he that is in us. We can have victory even though we know that it's tough out there that there is an adversary, there is opposition, and there's going to be opposition to everything you want to do that God has asked you to do. He's gonna oppose it. The enemy will come against you. Romans 16, 20 says, Satan is under your feet. Why is that? Because he's under Jesus' feet. You're a joint heir with Jesus Christ, and because the enemy is under the feet of Jesus, and Jesus came to destroy the works of the enemy, you too can have victory over Satan. He's under your feet in the name of Jesus. Somebody agree with that? Come on, just let me know. Thank you so much. So our Lord is displaying his ability to fulfill his purpose of bringing to naught, obliterating the works of the devil. That's what he was here for. He has total power over everything related to the devil. There's not a situation where the enemy trumps God. He always is in control. He always knows. He always triumphs. Victory is his, hence victory is yours. Is that cool? I like being on the winning team. And guess what? I read the back of the book, we win. Jesus has total power and he will be able to do what he says he will do in the end when it tells us in Matthew 25, 41 that he prepared the lake of fire for the devil and his angels. Now there's been some prevailing thought around that there is no hell. Maybe there's no eternal fire. And people float all kinds of little you know, thought bombs and little theories, try to kind of create some discussion and everything. Well, I'm sorry about that. It just goes against the word of God because the word of God says, yes, there will be a lake of fire and yes, the enemy's going in it. Unfortunately, for those whose name is not in the Lamb's book of life, the Bible also says that those who have not accepted Jesus also will have a destiny there. And that's the bad news. But the good news is Jesus said that the enemy came to kill and destroy, John 10, 10. But he said, I've come that they might have life and might have it more abundantly. So the the enemy can kill and destroy, but Jesus says, I've come to give new life. The kind of new life that you saw today coming out of that baptistry. You know, they're baptized in the likeness of of his death and raised to newness of life. It's a celebration because that's Jesus' agenda. Boy, he trumps the death of the enemy on every level. His resurrection from the dead won the victory for us all. (laughs) Hallelujah. Well, I want us to look at this. If you've got your first grace today, I want you to write a few things down. Number one, demons are real. Now, I'm not telling you any of this stuff this morning to try to scare you, try to shake you up, try to make you fearful. Lord knows we've had enough fear. Let's, let's bind the fear. You know, I, I want people to know that, that we're walking by faith. You know, we, we live in a faith realm and God takes care of us. You know, last week it was a perfect example of this. While everybody was all stressed out and people were coming unglued in the boat, Jesus was chill. Remember? Take a chill pill. Get Jesus in your boat. Maybe you'll relax a little bit. Maybe you'll understand that these things that are happening in your life, you know, the storms come and it's for the purpose of shaping us. It's for the purpose of growing us, teaching us to trust. I love that song that says, through it all I've learned to trust in Jesus. I've learned to trust in God and depend on his word. Isn't that what it's about? So, 
We can trust him even though demons are real. And I might add, not to be messed with, don't underestimate them. Demons are real. And we see this in Mark chapter five, in those first seven verses. We see that account, and you can go back and, and read through that. I'm not gonna read it again, but we see how this demonic, possessed man who's filled with demon possession and oppression on every level had been absolutely tormented as he was filled up by the demon presences that were resident in him. I don't understand exactly how so many wound up in this one guy, um, but when the demon spoke, Jesus called him out, um, he spoke and he identified himself as legion. He said, for we are many. There are many of us. Some people might say, well, if, if he's using the term legion, you know, there, there is a, you know, a term legion in, in those days referring to an army, like a garrison army, and it was thousands. We know that there were 2,000 pigs that got possessed Jesus gave permission for those demons to go into the pigs and they went running off the cliff into the water. Crazy, hence my title this week. Did you see the title? It's all about deviled ham today. Um, a crazy account. You know, and, and this, is, this is wild because these demons were very, very real but we don't see an account like this any other place in the scripture except the account where we see that the angels who fell from heaven were thrown out of heaven on a disciplinary measure by God. And um, we read about this, and I would call this downcast angels. Uh, under demons are real. This is who they are. They're, they're cast out angels. They used to be heavenly angels. And I don't know how this all occurred. In eternity past, there was an insurrection in heaven. And the way that this all happened was pride entered into the most beautiful angel of all heaven. His name was Lucifer. He was the chief worship leader of heaven, the most beautiful angel of all. And whatever got him all puffed up, whatever made him so proud, it was sin that could not stay in heaven. And that same sin which he manifested is the still same sin that we see today. So many of us have succumbed to the same sin, and we just... Couch it in other terms, it's a sin of pride for sure, but Lucifer said, I want to be like the most high God. I want to be just like God. I want to have the authority of God. I don't want to submit to God. I want to be the leader. All of these things caused God to have to discipline one of his chief angels of heaven in eternity past. Isaiah 14, verse 12, describes it. You ought to write this down, and I'm gonna give you a whole bunch of scripture today, and you probably ought to go and search these things out. I'd love you to study this. You'll know as you read these things what, what you're reading if you'll write them down. But this verse says, how are you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, who's also translated to be day star, beautiful, shining star of heaven at that time, son of the dawn. How you are cut down to the ground, you who had laid the nations low. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God. I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of assembly in the far reaches of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high but you are brought down to Sheol, to the far reaches of the pit. 
Did you hear how many times I said, I, 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 me, my, my? Surefire tip off that pride is ruling the roost. So, Satan was cast out of heaven. Luke 10, verse 18, and Jesus said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Of course, you know that Jesus was with God from the very beginning. The Trinity, he was there at creation. He's been there forever. He's eternal. He was always there. He was there when this happened in heaven, and he saw Lucifer cast out of heaven. And at that time, we don't know exactly how many angels were created, but they're created beings, they're spirit beings. We don't see them, but that doesn't make them any less real. Angels are real. God has created them, and there are millions of them. But when Lucifer fell, the Bible says he took a third of the angels with him. They bailed out of heaven. They evidently wanted to follow Lucifer and his proud talk more than they wanted to serve God. A third of the angels went with Lucifer. We read about this in Revelation 12 with uh, verse three. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon, this is talking about the devil, with seven heads and ten horns, and on his head seven diadems. His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. This is referring prophetically, looking back and envisioning this scene where Lucifer took a third of the angels with him. So this is who demons are. This is who Jesus confronted in this land of the Gerasenes. This man that was possessed. What was he possessed with? Demons. And so what are demons? Demons are fallen angels. So this is very, very clear cut in the scripture. There are either angels who serve God and God's team. There are those who ser serve Lucifer and Satan and his team. Spirit beings, they're very, very real, but that's what demons are. When you see things in our culture that are talking about, oh, things like ghosts and apparitions and, and you know, talking about tales from the crypt and, you know, even Casper the Friendly Ghost, the little cartoon, and, you know, the, the movie Ghost and, and all these things with the, the mediums and the channeling and, and all these things. I'm sorry, none of that is true. Hate to disappoint you. They're great stories, but the Bible tells us what these things are. They're demons. Former angels that now serve the agenda of Satan. Their purpose is to kill and destroy. They want to destroy those who are made in the image of God. They want to, to kill everything that God loves. They want to kill your life, your spiritual life, your spiritual growth, your decision to follow Christ. They want to undo all of that because they're against God. So anyone who's made in the image of God is the enemy. They want to destroy those who are made in the image of God. That's the reason why I know that Satan hates women especially. Guess why? Because they bear children who are made in the image of God. Why do you think there's such an onslaught against women in our culture? <laughs> because the God of this world is out there and he hates women. You might think, well, I, I really want to protect my children and my, my grandchildren. Well, I'm telling you right now, you're going to have a job because Satan hates them. He wants them destroyed. Unfortunately, we have a, a willing partner in our school system in America today who are more than willing to get onto a satanic agenda and help destroy our kids. All the things we've seen within this last year, it's just one more sign that Satan is stepping up the pace because his days are numbered and he wants victory. He wanted victory in this situation, but Jesus shut him down. Whew. 
That is the answer. Okay, so we know that there's a satanic agenda out there, but once again, greater is he who's in us than he that is in the world. It's time for Jesus to shut down that agenda. And how's he gonna do it? He's gonna use you. He's gonna use your prayer life. He's gonna use you as a spiritual warrior to get in there and in the name of Jesus to take the territory back that Satan has taken. Hallelujah. Come on, let's give him a hand clap. So, death and destruction are the agenda of the devil and the demons. And I've already quoted to you that the thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy, John 10.10. 10. But Jesus said, I came that you might have life and have it abundantly. It's the other side of the coin. The total opposite of what Satan's agenda is. That's what God wants for you. So, there are some folks here today that have been playthings in the hands of the enemy. You've toyed around with things you shouldn't have. You've toyed around with things, you've been in bondage. There have been things that have been out of culture in your life. Things that have not been what they should and you were on a path that was headed a wrong direction. Satan was really happy about that because you were on a road to destruction. That's what he wants. Oh, but then. Jesus, the chief shepherd, comes in with his shepherd's hook, and he gives life. He's come to give life more abundantly, and he hooks you around the neck and says, hey, wait a minute, you're on the wrong path. And you turn to him and realize that you were hornswoggled by the enemy. You were sold a bill of goods. He told you that you were gonna have happiness and fulfillment and contentment and you were gonna be rich and you had all of this stuff promised you by the enemy. Nothing but disappointments. Jesus said, you can have life and have it more abundantly. Follow me, follow me. And that's when salvation comes. We're snatched out of the clutches of demons, snatched out of the clutches of the enemy. First Peter five, verse eight says, be sober-minded, be watchful. Another translation says, be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Notice there, it says, like a roaring lion. This is another thing that's unique to Satan. He is a counterfeit on every level. He's the moon god in Islam. No light of his own, he's just a reflection. No light of his own. Jesus is the one who is the light of the world. Jesus is the one who is the lion of Judah. Oh yeah, and he's got way more than just a big roar. He's also got strength and power and the grip of mighty jaws. Yes, he does. But Satan prowls around like a roaring lion. But he has no teeth to the one who has the Holy Spirit resident in them. Satan has no teeth unless you give him the entrance. Hey, don't mess with him. We're aware of his schemes. We're aware that he's powerful. We see his handiwork in our culture today. We see his emphasis around the world. We see the way that he uses all kinds of media and music and messages and all kinds of things. We're not unaware of his schemes. We know that he was the most beautiful angel in heaven. And isn't it amazing that some of the things that will destroy you the most are the most beautiful looking. They promise everything. Oh yeah, you can have everything. Your best right now. Hey, let me tell you, it's a lie. Satan is the master deceiver. Jesus said, I've come to give you life more abundant. Hey, his ways are higher. His ways are greater. He is king of kings and lord of lords. And one day every knee is gonna bow and every tongue is gonna confess 
that Jesus Christ is Lord. Those who don't will wind up in a real place called hell. And it is a real place that burns with sulfur and scorching heat, and it will last for eternity without end. I don't know of anybody who wants punishment like that. And occasionally, we hear some scoffers in our society say, well, you know, I just really think my hell is right now. Honey, you ain't seen nothing yet. If you think this is hell, (laughs) you've got another thing coming. Or somebody who would be so cruel as to say, well, you know, I'm experiencing hell in my marriage right now. I know what hell is. Never let it be said. You don't know what you're talking about when you say something like that. Or when you use the word hell or tell somebody to go to hell. Do you know what you're damning them to? Or when you just say, damn you. You're talking about damning someone to hell. The only person that has the right or the authority to do that is God himself, because he's just. He's just. He's not a cruel God, and he's not sending just helpless, innocent people to torment forever. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. There's a choice to be made at every juncture. And he wants you to have life. That's the reason why we started off by saying, greater is he who's in you than he that is in the world. He has an exciting, awesome destiny for you. He doesn't want that destiny. He's prepared that torment, that punishment for Satan and the fallen angels, the demons of hell. Those things are real. Unfortunately, all the other depictions in our society are not. We could go into all kinds of details. A lot of times people will say, well, you know, there was, a, there was some sort of a, like a ghost that I heard saying all kinds of things, literally speaking, and they were telling people things that were, that were really true about their lives and stuff like that. Well, you know, the Bible in the Old Testament calls those familiar spirits. You know, they're, they're spirits. They, they're not seen with our human eyes, but they observe your life just like the angels of heaven do. They see your weaknesses, and let me tell you, they know how to get you to fall. (laughs) There there have been times, literally, where where I have felt almost like, you know, I probably did it myself, but it felt like maybe a demon or somebody was pushing a button on the computer and all of a sudden something would come up that was like, (gasps) what? We've all had it happen. They know how to push your buttons, not just on the computer, but in every area of your life. They know how to bring on things that will encourage your rage, your lack of patience, your lack of self-control. They know how to push those buttons. We call them familiar spirits. They know everything about your life. They watch your life. They can speak. They have the capacity, even as this demon did through this demoniac in the Gerasenes. He spoke. Jesus probably had every angel in heaven named. And you see all throughout his ministry, he's asking the demon, what's your name? Probably they were named in heaven. I don't know if they've taken other names you know, since then, but Jesus knew and he, he knew who these were. He's God. He created all of them. Why do you think they had to respond to him? And when this man who was demon-possessed had this demon speaking out of him, listen, this happens. It still happens today. I have witnessed this. I have heard demon-possessed people speak with a demon's voice. This still happens today. And a lot of times you say, well, you know, I, I just really haven't experienced anything like that. Well, you know, have you ever thought that maybe Satan has got such a grip on your life and on this nation already? He doesn't have to do much work. He's already got us in so much bondage and we're involved in so much idol worship and we're involved looking and acting and being like the world so much, he hardly even has to work. Much less unleash some host of evil presence on you because, you know, He doesn't have to work hard on the people he's already got. 
Wow. But domination by possession and oppression. You know, we, we see this, and I'm still talking about those first seven verses where the demon-possessed man, you know, is looking at Jesus, and basically he responds by crying with a loud voice, and, and he acknowledges right there in front of the disciples and everybody the, the same kind of thing that was acknowledged in the boat. What kind of man could do these things? Obviously, he's the son of God. This demon named Legion says, son of the most high God, calls him that by name. Wow. So the demons know who he is, yet it's so difficult for some of us to acknowledge that Jesus is God and he, he's willing to save us. He wants to be our ally. He wants us to be on his team. The demons know who he is. The Bible says they believe and they tremble. They're under subjection to Jesus and his authority. Because it was Jesus, it was Jesus as God who created them all in the first place. He was there when Lucifer fell from heaven. They're under his feet. Satan is under subjection to Jesus. Why is it so hard for us to get this through our thick heads? That we can be on the winning team and that we don't have to follow after the world and after Satan. We don't have to. This demon said... We're legion. And Jesus immediately said, come out of this man, you unclean devil. The demon begged to be turned into the herd of pigs. I don't understand all the nuance of this. Obviously, since we're not living in the spirit realm, I can't give you a lot of insight about why these demons um, wanted to go into the herd of pigs. But this demon was obviously scared that he was going to be cast out of the country, the scripture said. And this goes back to the fact that demons are set up in a hierarchy under Satan. There are principalities and powers. We see this in the story of Daniel. We see this many places in the scripture where we realize that there are regional authorities that Satan has set up an army and there are generals within his army that are also fallen angels, all demons, all fallen angels, but they've got a hierarchy. And the purpose is to dominate areas of the world, to dominate countries, to dominate cities, to dominate towns. We, we've got to pray that our city will not be dominated by the forces of Satan. The thing that will push it back and will push the gates of hell is us rising up. We are the church. And Jesus said the gates of hell will not prevail against us. But we've got to push the gates. We have to stop it. We're the ones who have to take authority. Well, this is something that the scripture clearly teaches. And we see all throughout scripture that these demons are in an organization and evidently, this group of demons, however many thousands there were, they didn't want to leave the country, and so they asked for permission to go into the hogs. So you might say, well, that was kind of a nasty thing for Jesus to do to those townspeople who were probably taking care of those pigs and wanting to have a ham dinner. Well, it wasn't Jesus' idea. Just read. You know, this was the idea of these demon spirits. They wanted to go into the hogs. Jesus gave his permission. That was the one thing he did. And he cast the demons out of the man. Now, we, we don't get his name. <clears throat> we don't have a lot of information about all the things that happened in this situation other than the important part. And I'll just tell you what that important part is. The man was delivered from bondage. Do you know how huge that was? He had been cutting himself 
trying to destroy himself because of the presence of these demons and Satan in his life. He was bent on destruction. What do you think is behind the suicide epidemic in America? Who do you think is whispering in their ear <clears throat> when they say there's an epidemic of suicide in our teenagers? Who do you think is whispering in their ear? Yep. It's the one who wants to kill and destroy. This is the reason why they need to hear about Jesus. This is the reason why we gather together, and this is the reason why we preach. This is the reason why we share the message we do, because there's hope in Jesus. Jesus was in authority in this situation, but the demons had to be subjected. They had to be put down and then cast out. Hey, Cast him out of your home. You know what I'm talking about? Go around and look at the influences in your home. Cast out the things that you know are demonic. I don't see any reason at all for a believer in Jesus Christ to have R-rated movies in their house. Cast them out in Jesus' name. It's nothing but garbage. It's satanic agenda. I don't see any reason for violent video games to be in a believer's house. Every time you allow these things, you're opening a portal to hell itself. Hopefully, not to your kids. But these things are rampant. I've been in situations where young people brought their gangster rap and their nasty music and all the violent stuff that they're listening to and burn CDs and, you know, purge their, their <clears throat> MP3 players and their, their iPods and things of all the junk. You know, we accumulate junk. And before you know it, there's an opening for the enemy. And you might say, well, I, I'm worried that I might be demon-possessed. Well, maybe you ought to be worried. Because maybe there's been a portal that has allowed way more satanic stuff into your life than godly stuff. And I don't want anybody to get into a spirit of fear today because the most important thing is not that you're filled up with demons or possessed by demons, but are you filled with the spirit? That's the question. Because in the word it says, don't be drunk with wine wherein it's excess, but be filled with the spirit of God. That's the important part. The important part is not whether, you know, there's, there's room, it, it's, there might be room in, in, in my life. You know, a, a devil might just jump on me. Or pastor, you know, Satan, whew, he got on me this week. And well, you know, he couldn't do any of that if you were filled with the Spirit. Because greater is he who's in you than he that is in the world. So the way that they do it is by domination. We see it in Matthew 17, another situation where Jesus cast out a demon. <clears throat> we see another one in Luke chapter 11, verse 14, where Jesus cast out a demon that was making a man mute, he couldn't speak. All of these things, Acts 10, verse 38 says, you know of Jesus of Nazareth, how God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power. And how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. How do you overcome oppression and possession by the devil? Get Jesus. Amen. That's it. I'm sorry, it's a short answer. Get Jesus. Be filled with the Spirit, and then you have no worries. So we talked about these things, you know, and this was the same situation. Jesus cast out this legion of demons out of this man, and immediately he bowed down and worshiped Jesus. Number two is the declaration of authority by Jesus. And we're going to go through this quickly because this is really important 
but I want you to see this. Matthew 28, verse 18, Jesus said, all authority in heaven and in earth has been given to me. All authority. Authority over demons, authority over nature, we saw it last week. Authority over every situation today in your life, over all your storms, Jesus has authority. He's worth trusting, right? He's worth trusting. Amen. It's so awesome. Philippians 2, verse 9 says, Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and in earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess. Somebody say every. Every tongue, human, demonic, angelic, every tongue confess one day that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. James chapter 2, verse 19 says, you believe that God is one, you do well. Okay, so you believe that these things are real. Well, guess what? Even the demons believe. <laughs> they also believe. And they shudder. They tremble. Because they know who has all authority. They know who has all authority. So the question is not whether this is real. And I've told you the truth about what's real. And it's not that I have a closed mind. It's just that my mind is focused on the word. Truth is narrow. It is, just by nature. Truth is narrow. But the word is clear on what all of this is. Demons are fallen angels. Satan has an agenda. God also has an agenda. And it's about giving you new life. It's about all the good things. It's about the best. It's about eternal heaven. It's about your awesome destiny right now and for all eternity. It's the best. It's something that you can raise your family on. It's something that you can rise up in in this life right now and experience power from heaven in your life. It's so awesome. It's by the authority of Jesus that that all happens. We see that in Mark 5. Those verses between 8 and 13. You see that Jesus had authority even over that legion of demons. This is probably one of the most graphic, dramatic stories of something Jesus did. Mark gives us all of these nitty-gritty little details. And I love this because it's so depictive. Listen, under the authority of Jesus, not only is he loving, not willing that any should perish, but Jesus is the righteous judge. And let me tell you what's going to happen. Damnation of Satan and demons. And we talked about this. Hell is real. I don't want you to fixate on this, but that is a real destination. And unfortunately, the Bible says there's a broad road that leads to destruction, and there's a lot of people who are going to be on it. What's that mean? We ought to be concerned about sharing Jesus because there are a lot of people outside these walls that are going to go to hell if they don't hear I say, Pastor Bruce, you're putting me on a guilt trip. Okay. Go on one. It puts urgency inside of me. I know that this is real. I know that this story is real. I know that there are people that I'm coming in contact with every day that if I don't share Jesus with them, they're going to go to hell for eternity. And yeah, that bothers me. And it ought to bother you. We have responsibility. We need to tell them, especially if you've got family members that don't know Jesus, they're not walking with the Lord, you're not sure that they're even believers because you see no evidence in their lives. Share Jesus with them, please. Please share Jesus with them. You might be the only missionary that they'll ever listen to. They need Jesus. Otherwise, we read it, John 12, 31, judgment is upon this world and the ruler of this world will be cast out. Eventually, Satan's time is up. Probably soon. 
Revelation 20, verse 10 says that the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet were, and they will be tormented, listen, day and night forever and ever. Woo! Hmm. And then there will be some goofy person that will come up to me and say, well, Pastor Bruce, you know, I know what you're talking about, but, you know, all my friends are going to be there. We'll just have a big party in hell. Have you ever heard somebody say something like that? That is the most ignorant, stupid thing that anybody could ever say because that shows that they have no comprehension of what is actually coming. You see... The Holy Spirit gives illumination so that we understand this is real. This is worth being urgent about. There is a reason why Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Share salvation. We don't want that destiny for our friends. We don't want that destiny for our families. We don't want that destiny for the people who are around us. What kind of a travesty would it be if all the people in this neighborhood went to hell and here we have this shining beacon of message and hope right here and they didn't get it. Shame on us. Jesus was not afraid to step up and say, listen, I know what this is about. Satan, get out. And he took that man and it, it says that he wanted to be with Jesus. You see, underneath all of the junk of the world, people want Jesus. They need to be filled up by the power and the love of Jesus. Here it is, Revelation 20, and just so you know that I'm not coming up with these things on my own. Revelation 20, verse 15 says, if anyone, not talking about the angels now, anyone, if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Well, <clears throat> a couple of weeks ago, we went to Bryson's graduation ceremony over at Cedarville. And the man who is the president emeritus at Cedarville gave the closing prayer. And I leaned over and told Brooke, who was sitting next to me, I said, he was the man who preached when I gave my heart to Jesus. He came as an evangelist and I heard him. I was only 13 years old. Guess what he preached on that day? The reality of hell. The reality of hell. I think he probably preached this verse from Revelation 20, verse 15. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. You see, hell is real. I'm, I'm sorry, there are all kinds of clever Christian books out there that are written by all kinds of luminaries in the Christian world that challenge this idea about the reality of hell? Well, their argument's not with me. It's with this book. Because I'm reading you what the book says. You know, I'm addicted to the book. I love this book. And I love the fact that it doesn't just say, okay, this is potentially where you're going and there's no way out. Oh, there's a way out. And we sang it today. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Remember that? This demoniac in the Gerasenes, he responded. He repented. He turned to Jesus. Oh, yeah. The pigs turned into devil ham. And it wound up being Jesus' ultimate freedom food the guy got free the pigs turned into deviled ham and it was a happy ending but see it doesn't always turn out that happy 
Because it's not enough to have the presence and the possession or the oppression of the enemy cast out of your life. You've got to be filled with something then. That's the reason why the Bible says be filled with the Spirit. Allow Jesus to fill your life. The Holy Spirit comes in and takes control. There's no room for anything else. And then the Bible says resist the devil and he will flee from you. You resist. You say, "Uh uh-uh, devil, no. I'm not going to those old places I used to go. I'm not hanging with that group of people who were bad influences. I'm not going with those people anymore. I'm not gonna do the same kinds of things that I've been habitually doing and tearing up my life without even thinking about it because I was on the broad road and I'm gonna get on the narrow road. I'm making a change right now because this is not gonna be my destiny. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna go there. It takes your decision to demonstrate the saving power of Jesus. And that's number three, demonstrating the saving power of Jesus. And Jesus told this man, go back, tell the town what I did. Tell them about the power of God. Talk about how Jesus saved you. Talk about the things that God did in your life. Talk about it, Chase. Talk about how God rescued you this week when you could have hit your head and been gone. This young man, yeah. Sometimes we we don't even know that God is protecting us. We have the power of his Holy Spirit inside of us and we're protected. And here he had this horrific accident this week and came out with nothing but a sprained ankle. Could have had multiple bones broken, could have had a concussion, could have had his face bashed in, hit his head on a rock, and doesn't even have a bruise on his head. That says God is powerful. And he manifests in these ways. And a lot of times we don't take the time to look and notice, but God's in control, and no matter how bad it looks, the outcome can be one that will bring glory to God. It's up to us then to just say, listen, God did this. He saved me. I was protected. I'm saved. No devil in hell is getting me. Hallelujah. I'm casting him out in Jesus' name. I'm resisting the devil. I'm resisting those old bondages. I'm getting that stuff out of my life because I want to make room for every ounce of the Holy Spirit I can have in me. I want to be filled on every level. And I'll just tell you right now, that will be the place of freedom that you can love and live in. He was definitely king of kings. Jesus, king of kings. He was definitely ruler of all creation. Everything. Everything that he created, including the devil. He created all of it. Yeah, he knows how to deal with it. And, of course, Jesus was definitely God. Make no mistake about it. When you come to Jesus, you know that you have the fullness of the Godhead. It's right there. He's involved. He wants you. He loves you. He's ready to be your ally. He's ready to be your teammate. And you and Jesus make a majority. So stand strong. Kick the devil in the teeth. But do it with your life's actions. Hey, words only accomplish so much. But when you back it up with life choices, there's some power there. Jesus will enable those choices and will demonstrate the saving power of Jesus and let the world know that he's Lord. Let's pray.